You know, I actually have a master's degree in fish biology. And considering how awesome and diverse fish biology is, it's something that I think is really under-discussed here on YouTube. So today marks the first official episode of Fish Facts Friday, where we dive into the biology of various species of fish, especially ones that are involved in aquaculture and fisheries. Today, we're talking about trout. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode from New Agrarian on YouTube, where we're all about aquaponics, hydroponics, and agriculture. Today we're actually talking about fish biology, and specifically we are talking about trout. So let's get into it. So kind of what sparked this video is we recently got some trout and salmon eggs that we're trying to hatch to eventually stock into the wild as a conservation effort. So I figured what better time to discuss trout and salmon biology than right now when we have these eggs and you guys will get to see their development. So you may hear me on this channel use the word salmonid from time to time and that just refers to trout, salmon, and other fish that are in the salmonid family, which includes trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, brook trout, lake trout. There's all these other hybrid trouts now, tiger trout and whatnot, as well as salmon and graylings, which you've probably never heard of, but they live in like Arctic waters. A couple things that these guys all have in common is they prefer cold water and they are carnivorous. Salmon are also anadromous, which means they migrate between salt and fresh water, as do rainbow trout sometimes. If there's any steelhead fishermen watching this, a steelhead is just an anadromous rainbow trout. So they've all kind of got that in common in addition to the fact that they're what's called secondary gymnobarians. Yes, that's a real thing. And it refers to their ovaries. In regards to fish reproduction and fish ovaries, most bony fish are what's called cystovarians. This basically means that they hold their eggs in tissue that is connected to the oviduct. So what does this all mean? Salmonids, being secondary gymnobarians, actually hold their eggs directly in their body cavity. Why do we care? Well, we care because fish that do this, and it's not very common, we can actually extract their eggs very, very easily and then raise them in aquaculture, which is what we're doing. So this is a very common process that happens at hatcheries all over New England and probably the Northwest, where you can simply push on the body cavities of females and they release their eggs. If you've ever caught big female salmon in the fall and sometimes into the winter, you might see that they release their eggs unintentionally. Again, this is because those eggs are kind of loosely held in their body cavity. So once the eggs are extracted from your female, you take your male brood stock and you do the same process. You run your hand along the ventral part of the fish's body and you fertilize the eggs with milt. In hatcheries, once those eggs are fertilized, they need to go through what's called a water hardening process. So over the next day or two, the eggs will harden up. They'll use the calcium and minerals in the water to form a shell. And during this water hardening stage, they're very sensitive to chemicals. They can actually absorb those chemicals into the egg. But basically after this water hardening process, the main concern is fungal problems. So the eggs will actually develop a white fuzzy coating on them. Some hatcheries will use formalin and some other disinfectants to control pathogens at this point. You just remove the egg from the batch so that fungus doesn't spread to the other eggs. Temperature is very, very important during this incubation process. I've actually hatched trout eggs a few times, and if the temperature is too warm, the fry will actually develop spinal deformities, and they'll just kind of swim in a circle like that. And I actually raised a fish one time that had a spinal deformity to be six to eight inches. I couldn't do away with him, but, uh, he made it, he just was very deformed. But my point is, during the incubation process, you have to keep the temperature really, really cold using a chiller. And I keep these at 45 to 46 degrees. You'll notice on these eggs that there's a little black dot. These are called eyed eggs. The black dot is the eye. That means they are fertilized, they're water hardened, and they're ready to rock, they're ready to hatch. You also wanna keep incubated eggs in a dark place. You'll notice that I have foam around my tanks. This keeps the tanks insulated and also very dark. Salmon eggs hatch faster than trout eggs. But after about one and a half to two months, these trout eggs will hatch into what is called a yolk fry. It is simply a larval fish, very underdeveloped mouth parts and gills, but it has a yolk sac on its body for nutrition. It'll then just kind of vibe out until it absorbs that yolk sac, in which case it will be a swim up fry. So in the wild, trout here in New England lay their eggs in what's called a red, which is basically just a stone nest in a stream. If this process does occur in the wild, 
They are called swim up fry because after the fish absorb their yolk sac, they swim out of the rocks. They swim up. And this process you can actually observe if you hatch trout eggs, if you have like an upwelling incubator or something, they will do the same thing. Once the trout fry swim up, they'll start consuming food and they will develop what's called par marks on their side. I read a Native American proverb years ago that I can't recall at this very moment, but basically par marks are colorful marks that go up the side of the trout. And Native Americans believe that was like a hand touching the side of the trout and make finger marks, something like that, kind of cool. And then basically they live their lives. So now the question is, how does this relate to aquaculture? Well, the unfortunate part of all this is trout have a really tough time spawning naturally in the wild. There are a few places where it occurs naturally still, like the Farmington River, there is a consistent supply of really cold, well oxygenated, clean water. But the reality is the spawning process is really, really limited naturally. So because we're able to strip eggs from salmonids artificially, we're kind of able to do this in captivity, in nurseries, in aquaculture facilities, and stock these fish back into the wild, which is exactly what we're gonna do. So if you wanna see that process, definitely hit that subscribe button. I'll do some updates as the months go on here, and I'll definitely keep you guys posted as these fish get larger. So I hope you guys learned something. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Fish Fact Friday, and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.